Hey everybody, Brian Allred, Teaching Pastor, New Life Presbyterian Church in Yorktown. Welcome back to our series on Learning to Love Leviticus, where today we are going to at least begin the last lesson in this series on Learning to Love Leviticus. This is now the 44th lesson. So I hope if you've journeyed with me this entire time that uh, many of you are able to say that you are indeed learning to love this book of Leviticus, but my heart would be especially encouraged um, if some of you have actually learned to love Leviticus already through these series. You're no longer learning to love it. You actually do love the book of Leviticus. And basically what I've been aiming for um, in a more concrete way, obviously uh, the aim has been to help you to love this book of Leviticus by understanding it better. Uh, but my objectives, um, I don't think I shared with you early on in the series, uh, would be described this way. Uh, hopefully that, if, again, if you've journeyed with me through all of these lessons, 44 lessons on the book of Leviticus, uh, that you would be uh, prepared for and, and able to do the following kinds of things. You'd be able to outline broadly the literary structure of Leviticus. This is something that um, I've shown you almost at the beginning of every lesson where we talked about that uh, outline of the book of Leviticus where you see instructions for sacrifices in the first seven chapters and instructions related to the priesthood in chapters 8 through 10, um, instructions for purity in verses or chapters 11 through 15, instructions for atonement in chapter 16, instructions for holiness, so on and so forth. So you've seen it many, many times. So hopefully you'd be able to take that from uh, being with me through these video lessons. Uh, describe the context of the book of Leviticus and its content within the unfolding plan of God's redemption revealed in the Bible. Remember, we looked at the literary context and the redemptive context of the book of Leviticus. So, so hopefully you'd be able to describe that. How does Leviticus fit in to the unfolding plan of God's redemptive purposes? Obviously, it's an early book, third book of the Bible. So how does it fit into everything that has gone before in the book of Genesis and Exodus? How then does it fit into what um, subsequently comes into play in Numbers and Deuteronomy and uh, Joshua, Judges, Kings, Samuel, and into um, the New Testament as well? Uh, hopefully you'll be able to summarize some of the main themes of the book of Leviticus, uh, God's dwelling in the midst of his people, God's holiness, a call to be holy as his people, uh, the need for atonement, those kinds of things, uh, as well as explain the meaning and the function of the Levitical law in general, and also the meaning and function of various laws specifically. So we've taken a lot of time to do that. Uh, we began looking at those laws in uh, mostly in chapter 17. So we spent a lot of time just kind of walking through that, but obviously we needed to, to understand that those laws function in a particular way within Israel, that they may not function in the same way today within the context of the church, which leads to that next um, objective, number five there, apply accurately as a Christian the teachings of the book of Leviticus in specific ways, both in our personal lives and corporately in the church as a whole. Uh, remember, we don't live in the same redemptive time period that the people of God lived at the time of Leviticus. So some of those things, we'll look at this hopefully later today, if not in the concluding part of uh, the lesson next time. But um, that changes the shape of some of those principles that we read about in the book of Leviticus. For example, the food laws. And we talked about that at the time. What function did the food laws have in the nation of Israel to separate them from the surrounding peoples? And what function do they have or not have for us today when Jew and Gentile brought together in the church? So um, again, we, we looked at all those things, but that's that's what I've been trying to do is, is, is allow you to be able to do some of these things, all of these things really. Uh, but then the last one is what the, this lesson is going to be focused on. That is link the content of the book of Leviticus, the New Testament, and specifically to the person, uh, my face is covering that up, uh, to the person and ministry of Jesus. And so we've kind of weaved that throughout, um, looking at the content of the book of Leviticus through its various chapters. And so I wanted to conclude by just giving kind of a summary overview of how the book of Leviticus points us to the person and work of Jesus. You might remember that my approach in learning to love the book of, to learn the, let me say that again, uh, my approach to learning to love the book of Leviticus uh, was a three-step approach. The first step was understanding the context of Leviticus. And again, we looked at the literary and the redemptive context. And then understanding the content of Leviticus. We began this all the way back in, in uh, lesson four, where we began looking at chapter one with the burnt offering. And then we walked all the way through that. The third step is a very crucial step. And again, we've kind of uh, been looking at it all along within each lesson of the content. How does this content specifically point us toward Jesus? But that third step is crucial, and that is understanding the completion 
of Leviticus. Leviticus doesn't stand on its own. It stands as part of a larger redemptive story that has its fulfillment in Jesus. And so this is important to, to be able to see how Leviticus, not just the book of Leviticus, but any book in the Bible, uh, any book in the Old Testament, any book in the New Testament, how it is pointing us toward the salvation and the redemption that is found in the person and the work of our Lord and Savior. And so I just wanted to provide an overview of that as we uh, conclude this series of lessons on learning to love Leviticus. So one of the ways we can do that is just going back again through uh, the various uh, sections of the book and giving, again, kind of a summary of how these sections, how sacrifices, priesthood, purity, atonement, holiness, and instructions for dedication are really pointing us toward uh, the, work, the person and work of Jesus and finding fulfillment in him. And so we begin with instructions for sacrifices. And one of the things that, I mean, even in, I think, in my own mind, and uh, as, I've, as I've prepared for these, one of the things that was impressed upon me is this idea that the principles of faith that are in Leviticus are actually still binding. Uh, the form of those things might change because we're no longer in that same stage of redemptive history. But for example, there can be this idea that you, we read about all these sacrifices in the book of Leviticus, but now we know that we don't actually need sacrifices to appear before God, that God doesn't require sacrifice from us um, or by us or doesn't require any kind of sacrifice in order to usher us into his presence because he's just not like that anymore. Though That's actually not true. Uh, we actually still do need an atoning sacrifice for our sins to appear in the presence of a holy God. It doesn't take the same form as Leviticus, but not because those principles have become obsolete. It doesn't take the same form as it did in Leviticus because there has been redemptive fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus. And so Jesus fulfills all these sacrifices that we read about in the book of Leviticus, but he doesn't make them pointless. He fulfills them. For example, this principle is still true. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Apart from atoning blood sacrifice on your behalf, listener, there is no redemption for you. There's no hope of salvation for you. That is as true today as it was during the time of Leviticus. Again, the contours of that have changed. How, that, how those blood sacrifices are obtained have changed. Uh, but this principle is still true. Notice this comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But what we read also in Hebrews is that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to actually take away sins. It was provisional in a way. And then we get to the book of um, John in the New Testament. And the last Old Testament prophet uh, stands uh, in between the transition from the Old to the New Covenant. And he sees Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. That's sacrificial uh, language. That's a sacrificial title there. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We still do need an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus fulfills everything that we're reading about in the first seven chapters in Leviticus on instructions for sacrifices. For example, Jesus is the burnt offering we read about there, who offers himself in complete consecration as a pleasing aroma to the Father. This seems to be a clear allusion made uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses five through 10, where it actually alludes to another Old Testament passage, not in Leviticus, um, about uh, the one offering himself to uh, the Lord, consecrating himself completely to the Lord. Jesus fulfills this, and the author of Hebrews is telling us that Jesus fulfills this. Uh, so the burnt offering is really about Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the peace offering who restores us to fellowship with the Father, but also restores us to fellowship with others. We looked about, we looked at that um, feature of the peace offering when we studied it a long time ago. And that was it had a vertical dimension, but also a horizontal dimension where other people were invited to enjoy that meal. And so there's a reconciliation that happens vert vertically because of the sacrificial system that the Lord is instituting. But there's also something horizontal that happens in reconciliation. But the ultimate fulfillment of that is in Jesus. We I mean, you think about Ephesians chapter two, where he's uh, torn down the dividing wall of hostility and made out of Jew and Gentile, one body. That's, that's a horizontal thing, but it happens uh, through the work of Jesus in reconciling us to the Father and to one another. Uh, we read about the sin offering in the first chapters of Leviticus as well. And Jesus is the uh, sin offering who purifies us. Um, allow me to read at length uh, Hebrews. Hebrews 
uh, is a book that draws heavily on Leviticus, actually. So if you want to know the connections between um, the New Testament and the book of Leviticus, read the book of Hebrews because it's, uh, Leviticus is all over the book of Hebrews. Uh, but in, verse, in chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, we read that when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, there's that purification language, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Remember that the sin offering is also a kind of purification offering. And it's Jesus who provides that purification for us um, as our high priest. Uh, he's the intercessor, but he offers his own blood. We're going to say more about that in a second. He's a priest who offers a sacrifice, but that sacrifice is himself. So more on that in a little bit. Uh, the other thing, we read about five uh, sacrifices, remember, in the early chapters of Leviticus. We read about the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, or the purification offering, and the, and the guilt offering. The guilt offering is also fulfilled in Jesus as the one who pays our debt. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, with Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt, there's this language of debt here. We, we owed something. Uh, there was this um, justice that was required uh, by the Lord that um, we needed to restore to, to, to pay that debt. And of course, we're completely unable to pay that. And Jesus pays it on our behalf. He cancels that record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, the cross the place of sacrifice where he offered himself, offered himself as a guilt offering. Uh, notice that the grain offering is not on here. He does fulfill the grain offering, but he's the one through whom we offer our thanksgiving um, to the Father. Uh, he, he's, he's the only way we can do that. So that really leads to the second thing, and that is Jesus as a priest. Again, another kind of notion that can creep into our thinking is that, well, God doesn't require us to have a priest to uh, appear before him. We, we've been given access now. Um, we There's a... There's a uh, a priesthood of all believers, and certainly there's a there's an element of truth to that. But uh, we're only a priesthood of believers as we are united to Jesus, the great high priest. We still need a mediator, an intercessor, to advocate for us to be able to live in the blessed presence of a holy and righteous God. That that that's no again no less true today for us for for all people needing a mediator before a holy God than it was during the time that Leviticus was written. So we read about these, these instructions for the priesthood in chapters 8 through 10. Again, the priesthood is fulfilled. The need for a priest is not rescinded because of the work of Jesus. It's fulfilled. So we don't look for additional Levitical priests. We don't look for any other priest, actually, because we have a priest. It's not because we don't need one. It's because the priest that we need, we have in Christ Jesus by faith. Uh, 1 Timothy, again, New Testament passage. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We need a mediator. And the only mediator who can suffice for us is not any of the Levitical priests. It's not any of the pagan priests in ancient religions or contemporary religions. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone who can function as our mediator before holy God and bring us into his presence and reconcile us to him. Again, going to the book of Hebrews, New Testament, Jesus is our greater high priest. Um, chapter 7 through 10 in the book of Hebrews is all about that. The Leviticus priesthood has been surpassed. That's why we don't have Levitical priests any longer. That's why we don't rely on them. That's why we don't reinstitute it. Something has surpassed that priesthood, and that something is a someone. It's Jesus who has surpassed it. Um, he is the, the priest after the order of Melchizedek, as the, as the author of Hebrews puts it. So Hebrews chapter 7 through 10 is all about that. But he's the priest who offers himself. He doesn't offer the blood of bulls and goats. But as that passage we read before from um, Hebrews chapter 9 talks about, he offered his own blood. And he offered himself once for all. There's not a need for additional sacrifices. Again, 
That's why we no longer offer animal sacrifices or have to repeat sacrifices. It's not because we don't need a sacrifice. It's because the sacrifice we need has already been offered once for all, and it's Jesus himself who offers himself as a sacrifice. He offers himself once for all and lives forever to make intercession for us as our mediator. Hebrews 7.25 talks about this. A couple passages we can look at here. I've referenced um, Hebrews 9.6 up above, but this is what that says. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once for all time, a sacrifice of himself. Uh, notice the reasoning that Paul uses. So this is outside, um, you know, we, we looked at the, uh, the need for a priest or the mediator from 1 Timothy. That's a Pauline epistle, so that doesn't come from the author of Hebrews. Paul, again in Romans, asked this question, who is going to condemn us before God? Christ Jesus is the one who died, who offered himself as a sacrifice, but more than that, who was raised and who is now at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Of course, we're not going to be condemned if our faith is in Christ Jesus. He's the one who died to atone for our sins, and he's the one who lives now and is ascended to the right hand of the Father, who intercedes for us, and intercession is the work of a priest, of a great high priest, and that's who we have in Jesus. And so Jesus fulfills uh, the priesthood uh, as well. Uh, we can also look at the instructions for um, purity, chapters 11 through 15. And again, these instructions are fulfilled but not abrogated or set aside in Jesus. Uh, if you think about, um, and this is uh, where the title of Michael Morales' book come from, uh, has come from that I've quoted before, and I'll actually quote it again, probably not in this lesson because we'll probably have to make this into two parts. Um, but his book on the biblical theology of Leviticus is called Who Shall Ascend the Mountain of the Lord? It's based on these kinds of passages where in order to appear in the presence of God, in his sanctuary, in his heavenly sanctuary, to appear in his presence, what's required for that is purity and cleanliness. The unclean cannot appear before the Lord. Um, and we see that in Psalm 15, and it's echoed again in Psalm 24. O Lord, who shall, show, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? This is a reference to the sanctuary. Um, don't have time to get into all this, but I'd highly commend Morales' book to you. It's excellent. It's an excellent work of biblical theology. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. That's who shall dwell on the Lord's holy hill. Uh, the psalmist puts it this way. I think it's a Davidic psalm, Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. This has not been rescinded, people. Uh, in order to be accepted before the Lord, we have to be pure and clean, spotless. Remember that all the sacrifices in the Old Testament had to be without blemish, pure and without blemish. Jesus fulfills that, but he doesn't just fulfill it in himself. He confers that cleanliness and purity upon us. Jesus cleanses us by water and the blood. And remember, if we go through those chapters in Leviticus uh, chapters 11 through 15 again, what was often required there was water and blood for purification. And it purified the people so that they could they could draw near to the Lord in his holy place. Remember, they were driven, or they were, uh, what would be the right word? Uh, they were required to, to not enter into the courtyard of the tabernacle if they were unclean. And they had to be made clean again so they could draw near to the Lord in his sanctuary. Um, but the, re the way they became clean again was through water and through blood, through the purification offering, or what is sometimes called the sin offering as well. And it's interesting, in John's Gospel, in John chapter 19, verse 34, uh, we read that a soldier, after Jesus was crucified and after he died, pierces his side, and what comes out of his side is water and blood, um, imaging for us uh, this purifying work that Jesus does on behalf of his people for all who are looking to him by faith. We are cleansed uh, by water and by his blood. Now there is a sense in which um, that ultimate purification, I thought I had another line here, sorry about that. Um, there's a sense in which our ultimate purification awaits Jesus' return, where we will be completely made whole physically. Remember a lot of those purification laws had to do with uh, uh, physical kinds of uncleanness, uh, pregnancy, leprosy, uh, those kinds of things. That full purity awaits Jesus' return when we will be made 
completely pure and clean without defilement in both body and soul in glorified resurrected bodies. So there's a sense in which yes, Jesus fulfills much of this in the first advent, but it comes to um, ultimate completion and consummation, we could say, uh, at Jesus' return. Uh, well, this is end with here. We won't be able to get into uh, looking at how Jesus fulfills uh, the laws for holiness or chapter 27, that epilogue on um, the special vows that we looked at as well. So we'll save that as for part two. But instructions for atonement, I mean, this is this one of the, the, the key parts of the book of Leviticus, but it's one of the, the more evident uh, parts of the book that point forward to uh, the completion of the sacrificial system in the person and work of Jesus. Atonement is accomplished by Jesus. Why we don't observe a day of atonement, now Jesus has completed uh, what this book anticipated, uh, the cleansing of his people uh, by blood atonement. Jesus is both, remember, remember on the day of atonement, one goat is taken into uh, the most holy place where the blood of that goat is applied over the mercy seat. The other goat is taken out into the wilderness. Well, Jesus actually fulfills both parts of that. Uh, he's both the goat that is sacrificed, whose blood is offered before the mercy seat in the presence of God. Um, that, that is indicative also of the Passover lamb. Uh, when God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over and the avenging angel of death will pass over so that you will live. And so this is kind of replicated in uh, the tabernacle in the most holy place on the day of atonement where uh, when the Lord looks down upon the mercy seat, he will see the blood uh, that atones for the sins of his people. But Jesus is also the goat that's driven into the wilderness from the presence of God. He's exiled. We talked about that theme of exile uh, that's important, not just in the book of Leviticus, but it's also important uh, as a theme in the Bible. Adam and Eve are exiled. Israel is exiled. Jesus is exiled. Um, and he's exiled from the presence of God, just like this goat on the day of atonement. And we know that because he's crying out on the cross, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you deserted me? Why have you isolated me? Um, he's been exiled from the presence of God, but it's through his exile that sinners are brought near and are reconciled. And so he fulfills that imagery. Uh, a couple last things here. Uh, Morales, to quote him, he says, the primary theme in theology of Leviticus and of the Pentateuch as a whole, which is the things we talked about early on in the series, is Yahweh's opening a way for humanity to dwell in the divine presence. Once humanity fell in the garden, they were driven out of the garden. How can a sinful people now uh, dwell in the divine presence? Uh, well, the primary theme in theology of Levit Leviticus is... Uh, Yahweh's opening a way to do that, particularly through atonement, a theme that stretches through the horizon of the Pentateuch, its race finding their source at its highest arc, the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. So Le Leviticus is about atonement. The Pentateuch is about atonement. The Bible is about atonement. And the New Testament ta talks about how that atonement is finally and ultimately accomplished in Jesus. We read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, right after uh, Jesus dies, on the cross, behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This is a work that God accomplishes. It's accomplished from top to bottom. But when that curtain tears, it gives us access by faith because of the work of Jesus. Jesus opens a way for humanity to dwell in the presence of God forever and ever through his sacrifice. Uh, last quote here. Uh, from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places. Remember, only one person could do that at the time of Leviticus, and that was the high priest. But now, author of Hebrews is addressing everybody. and says, we have confidence. Right? We, we, we don't do it reluctantly or timidly. We have confidence. We do it humbly, but we have confidence to enter the holy places. And this is why, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest, there's this language again, over the house of God, let us draw near. Let us draw near because a, a way has been opened for us to draw near to God in his heavenly glory. Let us, draw, let us do so with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean, purity language, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so... Uh, again, it's this, this is an important step in learning to love Leviticus. It's to see how it's all pointing forward uh, to the Lord and Savior Jesus. So we see this in the instructions for sacrifices, instructions for the priesthood, instructions for um, 
cleanliness and purity instructions for atonement. We're also going to see it in the instructions for holiness. Again, I'm going to summarize that. We've looked at it before uh, as we've gone through uh, the content of the chapters, but we're going to summarize it again. And then also we see it in um, those last instructions even with um, the laws regulating uh, the give, gifts of uh, devotion or dedication, consecration, those kinds of things, the special vows. We see it there too. And then we'll have some just concluding comments in the next lesson as well. So um, two parts in the last lesson. So this is lesson 44. Uh, the next one, I think, Lord willing, will be the last one. So you don't want to miss the conclusion of the last lesson on uh, the completion of the book of Leviticus and the person and work of Jesus. So hopefully you'll join us then. In the meantime, God bless.